My grandfather was at the siege of Leningrad. Something demonic fed on people there. By CIA Herpes. I remember being not much more than a child sitting at my grandfather Dimitri's house. He smoked one cigarette after another, flicking the ashes in an old silver tray in the form of a red star. Like many of the possessions he owned, it looked a hundred years old. Clouds of grey smoke billowed around his face. The strain of many years seemed to weigh on him. His shoulders slumped, his will to live broken. Are you going to tell me the story? I asked. He told me he would the night before. His withered, wrinkled face didn't look at me. He stared at the diary he held in his mutilated left hand, something he still owned from the siege of Leningrad. I saw drops of ancient, black blood splattering the leather-bound cover. I looked at where his pinky and ring fingers used to be with horror, seeing the shining, smooth skin laid over the stumps. His eyes, so sunken and faded, started to water. Grabbing his long, white beard, he got up and started pacing. After a few minutes, he poured himself some vodka and took a few shots straight back with no expression. Then, he turned his bright blue eyes towards me. His skinny body trembled with excitement and terror. A faraway look fell across his face. I'll tell it to you, he said in a thick Russian accent, looking defeated. I'll tell it to you like I told it to your father and uncles. A man needs to know. He needs to know what's out there. It started with artillery fire far off in the distance. I heard the loud booming, a series of shells bursting close together, and then silence. I ran back to the apartment and told my mother and father. I was just a teenager then, 13 years old at the time but I knew what the explosions meant. The Germans are coming, I said, out of breath from the run. My father nodded grimly. Dimitri, we must get as much food as we can before the markets close, my father said. We had expected this. Reports had come in of the German Wehrmacht's swift advance across the countryside. Fleeing refugees from cities and towns to the west of us had spoken of horrors that seemed like unbelievable urban legends at first until more and more people came streaming in with similar stories. One survivor from the Soviet Belarusian Republic had told me that the Germans forced all the men, women and children of the town into a large barn. Then they splashed it with gasoline and set it on fire. If the people tried to run out of the burning building, the Germans would gun them down with automatic rifles. The refugee said he had only survived because he was out picking mushrooms for his family at the time but they had taken his wife, three daughters and mother from his home, forcing them all into a barn with the rest of the townspeople and starting the bonfire. He said he had come out of the woods near one of the infernos and saw German soldiers laughing and passing around liquor while agonised, haunting screams echoed out of the flames. A smell like searing pork chops and burning hair filled the area. Other refugees spoke of mass graves that shifted for days after the bodies were laid in them. They said the Germans would quickly try and shoot every person in the head, but sometimes they missed or only grazed the skull. Nevertheless, the Germans were always efficient, and the stunned victim would get pushed in and buried alive. We need to move towards the city centre, my father said, glancing at my mother with his cold, steel-grey eyes. We can move into your sister's apartment, maybe. My mother nodded. My aunt lived almost directly in the centre of the city, the place that would hopefully be captured last. I glanced out the kitchen window, refugees streaming down the street, walking and hobbling in great, filthy packs. They carried bags of food and clothes, or pushing rolling, wooden carts filled with their life's possessions. All of them slouched away from the areas around the perimeter of the city and headed towards the center of Leningrad, behind the fortifications. In the distance, I heard more artillery shells exploding. The Wehrmacht seemed to be drawing closer. My mother and father grabbed bags and filled them with our meager food, 
jackets and clothing. We certainly weren't rich, but we would have enough to eat for a few days at least. Little did I know then, but the siege that started that day in September of 1941 would last for nearly two and a half years and kill over one million people. By the time the city got liberated in 1944, only 700,000 people still lived and remained in Leningrad, a city of nearly 4 million people just a few years earlier. We moved into my aunt's apartment, a small two-bedroom flat not far from the St. Isaac's Cathedral. The onion-shaped golden domes glistened and sparkled during the day, but the rest of the city looked grey and tired. My aunt and her husband had barely any more food than we did to feed themselves and their two children. The adults tried to ration it, but after five days of tiny meals and gnawing hunger, the last of the food was gone. The Red Army official went from door to door on our first day at my aunt's apartment, giving people duties. I was told I would help assemble PPD-40 submachine guns for the ersatz soldiers recruited from the civilians of the city. My father, mother, aunt and uncle were told to go and help dig trenches around the city centre. We had worked in starvation conditions for a couple of months like this. My mother and aunt would go out and try to dig up edible roots or collect herbs and grass for a stew. I was constantly hungry. It was like some biting creature had burrowed into my stomach. All I could think about was food. All the time. Food. The adults had come back in great pain with sores on their swollen feet. They said they had to stand in pools of stagnant water at times when they dug trenches and helped with fortifications. I could only hope they would finish long before the winter and the biting winds and snow began. On a mild day in November 1941, I walked up the narrow stairs of my aunt's apartment building, opening the hallway door onto the third floor. I looked out a window and saw night had already come, blanketing the sky in a black nothingness and grey, dirty clouds. I had my mother and father's ration cards on me since I had grabbed our meagre daily portions of sawdust bread on my way home from work. A door swung open next to me and I saw one of my neighbours peering out through the crack. His dark eyes met mine, his gaunt, staring face morphed into a friendly smile. Raising one hand, he held me and asked me to stop. I had met him once or twice before. My father had told me his name was Mr. Kozlov. He was a labourer and, even after the period of starvation we had all endured, he still stood straight and tall with thick muscles and heavily calloused hands. Boy, he called conspiratorially, come here for a moment. Suspicious, I moved closer to the door. I smelled something delicious wafting out of his apartment. Looking towards the small, wood-burning oven in the corner of his kitchen, I saw a bubbling stew. Steam billowed upwards in fragment clouds from the concoction. What is that delicious odour? I asked, already hooked. Is that meat? The man nodded happily. I have a connection on the black market for meat, he whispered. Would you like to try a bowl? Perhaps we can find ways for you to repay me, let's say. I quickly nodded and he motioned me into the kitchen with a wave of his massive hand. Before he closed the door, I saw him check both sides of the hallway for something. I clambered over to the pot as if in a dream. I saw thick, fresh morsels of meat mixed with carrots and cabbage and celery. It smelled like heaven. My stomach growled loudly. The government had given my family some bread cut with sawdust and that's all we had really eaten besides grass and herbs. The sawdust bread had a crunchy, woodsy taste and hurt my stomach every time I ate it. The Soviet government had cut our rations of sawdust bread six times in the last month and a half since they had such a hard time getting through the German and Finnish encirclement of the city. I turned back towards Mr. Kozlov. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw something gleaming at dull silver as it swung towards me. I instinctively jumped back, my heart pumping. He was using a piece of steel rebar a few feet long like a club 
trying to smash my skull open. Stay still, boy, he screamed, swinging the bar back and forth. It whipped through the air so close to my face that I could feel the breeze it gave off as it whistled past. I looked around for a weapon, thinking I was done. How could I fight this crazed man who was stronger than me and armed with a metal bludgeon? But at that moment, I heard the shrill cry of a Stuka dive bomber overhead, so close that it sounded like it would fly right into the building. Mr. Kozlov froze, his eyes panicked like those of a trapped animal. There was a flash of light and a roaring sound. I thought I would go deaf and blind. Walls began to collapse all around me as pillars of flame rose up, tongues of flame licking the wood hungrily. Mr. Kozlov dropped the bar, his trembling hands open and closing. He looked straight up, and a beam from the ceiling dropped on his head. I heard the cracking of bones, blood sprayed in all directions as his skull collapsed. His neck twisted and broke under the weight as he collapsed, the beam pushing him down to the ground. Clouds of black smoke billowed into the apartment in suffocating plumes, the blazing inferno behind them making them flash and flicker with orange light. A siren began to sound close by, and then two more started up from farther away. The shrill whine of the air raid siren rose and fell in melancholy echoes. Coughing and sputtering, I tried to make my way out of the apartment, but I got turned around in the cloying plumes of smoke. I went to the wrong room, and there, on the ground, I saw three naked human corpses, all lying face up. Strips of flesh were taken from their arms, legs, torso and cheeks. The bones underneath peeked out through the mutilated flesh, gleaming in white underneath the jagged cuts. I gagged, reaching, thinking of the stew that I had come so close to eating. I turned and tried to run, feeling my way along the wall and ducking to take gasps of clean air. But I knew if I didn't get out as soon as possible, I would either suffocate or burn alive. I found the door handle leading out of the apartment. The cool metal touched my palm and I turned it, stumbling out and falling. The hallway was not yet on fire. The apartments on Mr. Kozlov's side had gotten a direct hit. Black smoke filtered in from around the doors. I wondered about my family. They were only three apartments away. I looked in that direction and saw the front door had become a curtain of flames. Horrible screams filtered out from the shut doors of the apartments. Suddenly, the door to my aunt's apartment flew open. Dark, choking smoke tumbled into the hallway. Coughing and sputtering, I backed away. I looked behind me and saw the stairs were still intact. A human pillar of flame shot out of my aunt's apartment. I saw my mother running, her hair on fire, her face melting and blackening. Drops of liquefied fat slid off her nose, dripping fiery oil onto her feet. She gave off a low, whimpering, choking sound as she burned. Then she stopped moving, swaying on her feet. Her eyes began to dribble out of their sockets. She fell limply forward, landing on her face. Slowly, she opened and closed her fingers a few times, clenching and relaxing. And then, then the last of her movements stopped. New shrieks and cries of pain and terror filtered out from apartments all around me. Covering my ears with my hands, I ran. I never saw my family again after that. Conditions quickly grew more horrifying after the bombing. I thought it was bad before, but I quickly realized just how much worse it could get. Cannibalism became rampant. Dead bodies littered the sidewalks and streets. People who died would often lay where they fell for days unless someone took the body to eat it. It was considered lucky to be buried in a mass grave. There were simply not enough healthy people to remove the bodies from streets and houses and apartments. Most everyone was, after all, either sick or starving to death, or both. Parents no longer allowed young children to go outside by themselves because they would disappear into thin air and appear later on in the black market meat trade. Some people tried to peel wallpaper off their apartment and eat the paste. 
Others ate grass or tried to boil leather shoes and belts to eat them. Bugs, mice and rats became delicacies and anyone who had grasshoppers or crickets could trade them for a high price. I ate so many rats that I learned to think of them as tiny roasted chickens so I could choke them down. After the death of my family, I was sent to live in a communal orphanage in the centre of the city. Many children had already lost parents to disease, starvation, bombings or suicide. However, no leeway was given. Even children as young as six were sent to assemble guns or to help dig trenches. I kept my mother and father's ration cards. I also never reported their deaths. I knew I could continue to claim their rations, perhaps indefinitely. I awoke on a cot in the darkness, my thin, ragged blanket barely providing any protection against the biting cold. Looking around in confusion, I wondered where I was for a long moment, and then the events of the last few months came crashing down on me. I felt the sharp hunger pangs rise up like stab wounds from my stomach. I ran my hand over my chest and felt the ribs sticking out, my skin stretched as tightly as a snare drum over the protruding bones. A small oil lamp stood on a nearby table. I walked slowly over, trying not to run into anyone else's cot. I couldn't see much more than silhouettes, but I got it lit and prepared to head towards the bathroom. Since there was no electricity or running water, the bathroom consisted of large, stinking wooden buckets that we all relieved ourselves in. The smell rising from them was atrocious, like rotting urine and hot feces mixed with the stink of sickness. A hand grabbed my shoulder. I jumped. Spinning around, I saw my mother standing there, her skin burnt to a crisp. I smelled something new now. Something like burning meat in napalm. Dimitri, she whispered slowly, the blackened skin on her body cracked as she leaned forward. I saw rivulets of translucent yellow pus and streams of dark, partially clotted blood rolling down from the wounds. I backed away, knocking one of the buckets over. I felt warmth cover my shoe as the rank, liquefied sludge spilled on me. She raised her arms towards me, like a child asking to be picked up. Mother? I asked. Mother, is that really you? Please, help me, she said through bleeding, cracked lips. It hurts. I had no idea how she was still alive. Something felt wrong about the situation. There was no way anyone in that condition could be alive less likely walking and talking. I looked past the burnt body, judging my chances if I tried to run. Dimitri, please, don't you recognize your own mother? The figure began to laugh, a sound like a choked death gasp. Patches of dead, blackened skin began to fall from the abomination's body, swaying like autumn leaves as they slowly drifted down to the cold stone floor. Tatters of destroyed cloth dissolved around its torso and legs. I watched in horror as the flesh continued to dissolve. Underneath, I saw something demonic and inhuman. Its face looked flipped inside out, with gleaming muscles running across its cheeks. Its nose looked like a snake's, just two gaping holes, giving a glimpse deep into the sinus passages. Blue veins and red arteries pulsed, its eyes shone a strange gold colour, filled with an inner luminosity that throbbed in time with its heartbeat. It wore a black robe that covered its demonic body. Its face twisted into an insane rictus grin as it ran at me. It came at a superhuman speed, a blur of dark motion. Instinctively, I grabbed the handle of one of the buckets near my feet. The handle was slick with human waste. As it reached me, I swung the bucket with all my strength at its demonic face. Its grin seemed to falter for a moment as the wood smashed into the side of its mouth. Shit and piss exploded in a disgusting geyser. The bucket broke into a thousand splinters. I felt my face get splattered with the waste. It went in my mouth and eyes. Spitting and gagging, I ran. 
Screaming in terror, I ended up waking up everyone else in the sleeping chamber. They looked at me with panic and curiosity. I can only imagine what they saw. A young, wild-eyed boy covered in excrement. But when they went to investigate the bathroom, they found it empty. Except for a mess of exploded shit on the walls and ceilings, of course. Over the next couple of days, I felt constantly watched. I would feel eyes running over the back of my neck. Sometimes, I would catch glimpses of a red, gleaming face staring out from an alleyway or an apartment window, its eyes glowing like twin sunsets. I knew I needed to get out of the city as soon as possible, but there was simply no way except by plane. Even with my father and mother's ration cards, I continued to starve. Bread rations got cut even more as the city quickly ran out of food. People began to go mad with hunger, and some were prosecuted for ripping flesh off dead corpses with their bare teeth in public. I had gotten to the point where I began to look longingly at the dead bodies littering the sidewalk on the way home from work. I could only imagine how much meat a single human body held. At this point, I would do anything just to feel full for five minutes. As I walked past the golden onion domes of St. Isaac's Cathedral one night later that week, the corpse of a child near my feet suddenly stirred. Its hand twitched. I looked down at its cyanotic blue lips and open, staring eyes, a sense of wonder and horror rising in my chest. Then it blinked. I jumped back and screamed as its hand snaked out and grabbed my ankle. Its eyes started to glow with that horrible golden light. Its grin spread, ripping the flesh on the boy's cheeks with a soft, tearing sound. Cold, clotted blood dripped down from the wound. I am hungry. So hungry, Dimitri, the abomination said in a child's voice. Will you not feed a poor, starving boy? Before I could react, its head jerked forward and its slit mouth opened wide. I felt a burning pain in my left hand. Looking down, I saw it had bitten off two of my fingers. Agony rose up through my arm in horrible, wrenching waves. I yelled for help, falling back. A few other people were nearby, and they came running. They found me lying there, crying and hugging my mutilated hand, the corpse of the dead boy only inches away. After that, I decided I needed to get out of Leningrad by any means necessary. I decided my best bet was to go north, where the Finns laid siege. I was definitely not going south, where the National Socialists waited. Getting out of the city was no easy task, especially with one partially fingerless hand throbbing and still oozing blood. But I didn't want to risk spending one more night here. I thought that if I did... I would wake up to find that abomination standing over me, ready to rip my throat out. I had to get around the Red Army sentries to get to the Finnish military. I knew the city as well as anyone, having lived there my entire life. In the darkness of night, I crept past dreary apartment buildings and half-destroyed homes. Luckily, the first sentry I found was sleeping, an empty bottle of homemade vodka laying at his feet. I reached the edge of the city and saw countless trenches stretching ahead of me. I looked down at the sentry and saw he had a rifle slung around his shoulder. I tiptoed close to the man, deciding to take his weapon in case I needed it. He snored loudly, his emaciated face twitching as he dreamed. Very carefully, I began to lift the rifle off his body. It was nearly over the top of his head when the man woke. He rose with a start, his eyes flying open. I saw golden light streaming out of them, and he grabbed my right hand tightly. Leaving so soon? It cried in a hoarse voice. I pulled away, kicking and fighting. The rifle clattered to the trench's dirt floor with a thud. I lunged for it. The abomination came at me, its body transforming in a flash to its true form. I raised the rifle up and shot it in the chest. It shrieked, an inhuman wail that echoed through the dark night around us. Then, I ran for my life. I ended up making it outside the fortifications. 
though the last sentry fired a shot at me as I passed. I heard it whistle near my head, but I didn't slow. I knew if I stayed here another minute, I would die. The Finnish sentries ended up seeing me and screaming orders. I dropped the gun and told them I was a defector. They quickly arrested me and brought me to a prisoner of war camp, where I spent the rest of the war. Hell, compared to what I had seen in Leningrad, the prisoner of war camp was basically a vacation. I later met your grandmother and we immigrated to the United States. I thought I had lost that abomination forever, until a few days ago. I heard a sound in the backyard and looked down from my window. And standing there, in a black robe, I saw two golden eyes spinning with their own inner light. I just want to thank CIA Herpes for allowing me to narrate this story. If you liked what you heard here, head over to their Reddit page and show them some love. I'll leave a link for the original story in the description below. If you're new here, please consider subscribing. And as always, stay tuned for one more nightmare.